Welcome to the Emerging Podcast. I'm your host, Jamal Robinson. On today's show, we are speaking with Charles Sherrard Jr. Charles is a professional services delivery manager lead for the U.S. Central Region for Google Cloud Consulting. He has a multi-cloud experience, having also led delivery teams as a practice manager at Amazon Web Services. In addition to cloud, he's taken on consulting and project management roles across companies like KBR, Exxon, AlertLogic, and more. Charles is a native Houstonian and uniquely talented as an author, writer, and producer for television and film. He's lived abroad in many diverse cultures, including the Republic of Macedonia, Greece, Budapest, Kuwait, and Dubai. He has a loving family who's poured into him, and he's also nice on the ones and twos. I know you're going to enjoy the conversation with Charles today, so let's get on to the show. Hey man, welcome to the show today. I appreciate having you on. Please introduce yourself for the guest. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Charles Sherrard. Um, I am a delivery lead for North America, Central Region for Google Cloud. Very cool. What does delivery lead mean? I'm assuming it's not UPS and <laughs> delivering packages. <laughs> well, uh, I, I work in the Google Cloud consulting business, and so my you know position in the organization focuses on um, helping to lead deals um, that we set up for different enterprises as they try to move to the cloud. So just helping helping customers, you know, deliver uh, value through Google Cloud. Okay, really cool. Now, sometimes is that called professional services or like it what is? Was, yeah, okay. I work for uh, the professional services organization within Google Cloud. Okay, for people that are interested in professional services, like what kind of skills do you need to get there? Or what was your background? Like, how did you get to this place? Uh, I had a background in consulting, so I'd spent. Uh, Prior to Google, I spent seven years with uh, Amazon Web Services in their professional services organization. Prior to that, I had done smaller, different consulting roles um, at different you know, organizations and startups uh, throughout my career. So it helps to have some background in consulting. Uh, a lot of times you may have previously been a customer of, of one of the consulting firms. And so maybe you have a little bit more intimate knowledge of how they work or the different technologies. Uh, but I think overall it helps to have a background in consulting of some sort. Okay. And you talked about the experience at companies, but is there certain like education or degrees that you can get that'll make you good or applicable to various consulting companies? Well, yeah. Yeah. When you think about it, uh, the consulting organizations, they have uh, positions that are as varied as just about any other technical organization. So you have folks who are more skewed towards the technical side. So maybe they have backgrounds in computer science or programming. You have folks like myself with a background in uh, business information systems. You got folks um, who are math and science majors. Um, you know, there's folks that I work with who have uh, PhDs in math. So I think it, it's very varied, uh, just as the technology uh, arena is varied. So depending on where you sit in the organization, um, you'll want to have skills that are commensurate with that skill. Okay. And when I think of consultant, I think of like maybe a stereotypical person that goes in, they kind of pitch something, maybe they pull out a whiteboard or presentations, but like no hands on keyboard. Is that an accurate description or? Uh, no, it, it absolutely isn't today. Um, tech, you know, consultant organizations do uh, everything from hands on keyboard work to very high level strategic work. Um, I think when you think of consulting, especially in the vein of, of a Google or an Amazon is they provide people who are uh, best in class at that particular technology, right? So um, with cloud, or if you think about a technology like generative AI, um, as an organization, you want to bring someone in who helps your organization to excel at that technology. And so having a consultant come in just gives you um, what you need to help drive your business value. Okay. So if I'm, I don't have a traditional consulting background, but I have skills in like software development or project management, it seems like all those roles would be available in a con large consulting organization. Absolutely. Okay. And then would you say that like for these large companies that their customer base are also only large companies or like do they range to like small to medium sized businesses or startups or? No, um, all of these organizations have, you know, they have sales organizations that span from, you know, startups to Greenfield. And then of course they go into larger enterprises. Um, you'll find that most consulting organizations run the gamut. Uh, of course, the, you'll hear about the larger deals, uh, but they, they focus on businesses of, of all sizes. 
Okay. And then I'm thinking back to my 20s, which was some time ago. But um, most of my friends that were at consulting organizations, I talked to them. And it's like Monday through Friday, they're just gone. <laughs> they're never at home. They're traveling all the time. Like, is that a big element of being in the consulting role? Well, for some organizations, right, you still have your larger firms in the world, the Accentures of the world, where uh, you may spend a lot of time on the road. You may spend a lot of time traveling to and from customers. Um, one of the things that happened during COVID uh, for all organizations is we saw that we were able to still support customers and do it in a remote fashion. So while we still travel to customers, we still are on site when we need to be, um, travel is not as intense as it used to be for consulting. So um, you'll find kind of a difference um, in every organization. Okay. And then I think one of the benefits I saw is like people that were in a younger stage in life, maybe they didn't have all the kids in the house and the wife or a husband, like it did give them the ability to travel the world. Yeah, absolutely. If you, I mean, you know, just, just being honest, I think for most consulting jobs, there'll be a certain percentage that you need to be available to travel to be considered for the job. And so you'll have to think about how that works for your lifestyle. Because some people may say, we want you to be available to travel up to 50% if possible, some maybe more, some less. Okay. And getting into traveling, is it something where you're traveling to a place in site, you're sitting in their office, you're doing work as if you're an employee, or are you just traveling for presentations or some of all the above? Yeah, it, it really depends on the role and the customer. A lot of times you'll, you'll go to talk to the customer about what their goals are. And that may be uh, traveling once or twice a quarter. Sometimes if you're actually delivering a solution to a customer, you may be there you know, throughout the week and traveling back and forth. Uh, with hands on keyboards supporting them. Um, it just really varies on, on what your role is and what you're doing for the customer. Um, someone in my role is usually spending uh, less time on site with the customer, but still helping to, to kind of craft and put together uh, the solutions that we're delivering for customers. Okay, makes a lot of sense. And you had mentioned earlier, like the KPMGs and Accenture of the world, but then also there is Amazon, and now you said you work for Google. Would you say that there's like, if someone's looking for a job to get into, are there big differences between cloud service provider or kind of non-cloud service provider? Um, there are differences and that kind of goes into when anybody's looking for a job, you want to look at that company for what they are trying to do, right? So you have some organizations who their business model is to spend more time with a customer. They may want to sign a deal that is four, five, ten years in length with a customer. You have consulting organizations who are focused on getting in with a customer, helping them, and then moving out and moving on to something else. Um, so each company is different in the way that they pursue business and what they think is the best way for them to provide value for those businesses. So I think it's very different from organization to organization. When you look at some of the bigger consulting firms, um, they're not going to hire as many people as, say, an Accenture. So they're more focused on, um, you know, helping the customer as quickly as they can, getting them up to speed, getting them trained so that they can then take over, and then they can go and help other customers where maybe some of the other consulting organizations may want to do longer-term deals. Okay. So just trying to understand that there's larger consulting firms that may take the initial project, but then they may outsource that or give it to another consulting firm to execute on it? Or Yeah, when you look at some of these emerging technologies, there may not be enough talent to go around. So you may see some consulting firms partnering together. So not working in competition, but say you and I have a consulting firm, um, you know, you may have 10 people and I may have 10 people and we can go to market together and help deliver something from that for that customer together. So you'll find more partnership than you will competition in some of these consulting organizations. Okay. And I laugh when you said Accenture because I used to work with them uh, and at, conveniently at Amazon Web Services also. And I think at the time they had about 475,000 employees. Now it's like 650. It's like, how do you stay competitive in that kind of environment or how do you stand out when you're one of almost a million people? Well, I, I really think in the consulting world, it's all about impact, right? So um, everyone has things that are expected of them for their role. Um, you know, one of the things I coach people to do when I talk to uh, people in an organization that I may manage is to look at your role, uh, look at what's expected of you, and then try to think of areas that you can, can that you can provide impact outside of that area, right? So. 
if you are, you know, a consultant, sometimes you can help with pre-sales or you can help to drive new deals or you can just bring something to sales and say, hey, there's an opportunity here. Maybe that's not your job, but it shows that you have a desire to have impact outside of your role. And sometimes those are the things that can elevate you, including your talent and being able to, you know, do the job that you're hired to do. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Another thing I see out in the industry is like the titles seem to be pretty crazy. So like I'll see executive, vice president, managing director of solutions and strategy. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean in real life? So can you maybe break down the structure of like how somebody should think about titles based off of where they are in their career? Sure. Um, in, in very basic terms, most most organizations kind of move from, um, you know, junior to senior, just just like everything else. So you'll see someone may come in as a, uh, a junior consultant at different companies. They may have them uh, associated with a level, um, you know, level one, two, three, four, five, but you come in as a, uh, maybe a junior consultant, then you move into a consultant, uh, a senior consultant, a principal consultant, then you're moving into higher levels, maybe a director or a VP level. Uh, so it's, it's more of a progression within the range of the role that you're in. And in these organizations, it's a little bit different than back in the day where you came in at one role and you just progressed up the ladder. Uh, and many of these larger technology companies, you can bounce around at different organizations, different technologies, different specializations. And in the same, at the same time, you can kind of move uh, up the ladder as well. Okay, and you talked about bouncing around. I also talked to my friend, friends back in the day and they would say things like, hey, I'm on this project for this month and then next month they're on something else or either next year they're on something else. Like how often do projects switch or does it depend? It really depends uh, on the sales cycle. So um, consulting is, is really driven by sales. So if, if a sales team goes to an organization and they sell a huge deal that is a multi-year migration um, you may see people have longer stays at that particular customer, uh, but at the same time, they could sell a, a three-week uh, generative AI you know, workshop, and that may only be a few weeks, and the consultant there may be there and move on to different places. So it really depends on the sales cycle, the pipeline, and the specialization that that person has. Okay. And also thinking of um, the unique aspect of customers, as you mentioned, you can go from enterprise to SMB to startup and so forth. Without getting into like company specific details, can you give examples of like use cases or the type of work that like maybe a company would have reached out to a consultant firm for so people just can kind of grasp like what type of work they might do if they step into this career? Sure. Um, I think most, most consultant organizations kind of work in a similar fashion. They talk to customers about their business needs and their goals and then think about how they can apply their specific technology to their goals. So if you think about a cloud provider, uh, whether it's Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they all have different flavors of technology that they can go to a customer and say, you know, hey, customer X, you want to build software faster and go to market faster than your competitors, we can help you do that. Or customer A, um, you want to have more insights to the data that you receive from marketing, we can help you do that with some type of solution. So, you know, you know, again, without being specific, it is um, really looking at what is the business value to your customer and do you have the ability to help them get there with the technology that you possess? And that's where the, the competition comes in uh, as to, you know, who does what better. Okay. That's really well said. Uh, also, you're a leader that runs organizations and you hire people. So what are the soft skills in addition to like maybe if it's a software development role or project management role? Like what are the soft skills that are kind of universal that people may be looking for? Uh, of course, you know, written, verbal communication, uh, teamwork, uh, the ability to context switch. You know, personally, I like people who are um, intellectually curious, right? Because there's when you look at the world of technology and you're in it as well, uh, every, I'd say every year, there is a whole new set of skills to learn. There's a new technology coming on board. Um, if you're not curious, um, it'll be something that may, may provide a setback for your career. So you want to be curious. You want to have good communication skills. Um, you want to stay, you know, stay hungry, learn all the time, be a lifelong learner. Uh, I think those things bode really well for most people. Okay. And when you talk about comp context switching, is this like, 
every three months or a year or whatever going to a new project or do people need to also manage multiple projects at one time? Uh, it depends from place to place, right? You, you could be on multiple projects, but I think the context switching just lies in, um, you know, some consultants work in a specific vertical, like I work in financial services, but lots of consultants work across industries. And so you may be on a banking customer today and on a manufacturer tomorrow, um, learning about their business uh, very quickly, being able to context switch and apply the technology to what it is that you're driving for them is really important. So you have to be able to kind of be a fast learner, look at different things and, and understand them. Okay. And thinking about your career and then people you've like mentored, would you say that it's more important to like focus in on one area of just making this up like I'm financial services, I have maybe skills in that area, but I hone my career towards financial services, or is it better to bounce around and be like a jack of all trades, or how do you think about that? My personal, you know, this is just me, doesn't mean that it's right. Um, I think specialization is the way to go. Uh, for me, my career really took off years ago when I decided that um, although I was interested in many areas of technology, I was proficient in project management, program management, delivery. So I focused and got more certifications in that area, more experience in that area. I stopped taking calls about jobs in different areas than the one that was my specialization. And I kind of saw my career take off from there. So to me, I think once you make a decision, now you can change clearly, but I think once you make a decision about what technology or what area you want to work in, um, it, it's a little bit better to specialize in that particular area. Okay, and you mentioned certifications, like back in the day when I was a little bit more technical, I had certifications in like big data and software development and so forth. Like how should people think about certifications in your space? Um, so in, in my space, when you when you look at delivering program and project management, you'll wanna look at um, some of the, the big certifications are the PMP, you know, that's kind of the, the grand the grandfather of certifications for program and project management. Uh, there are different Agile certifications, you know, Scrum Master. There's also a scaled Agile framework. Uh, but I think, you know, it's important to, to think about focusing um, your career and your certifications based on, one, what area do you feel like you are you're proficient in and that you can excel in and then two um, you know what does the market look like for your organization so you want to look at job postings uh, that's where making the decision comes in if you decide hey I want to focus on program management now you can start looking at job descriptions and find out what companies are looking for what certifications they think are more valuable and then you can focus your time and effort in being trained in those areas and I like the idea of like working backwards from what are people looking for. And then also you mentioned like kind of focusing on areas that are intrinsically motivating to you and then just kind of like going out there and that's where you can do your best work. I'm curious also because you've said um, essentially your field has like a diverse set of like skill sets they need. Is it fair? Two questions. Is it fair to say that like pretty much anybody from any kind of background has an opportunity to go work in your field? And then two, have you always worked in your field or did you have a career before that you transitioned from? Uh, no, I, I, was, <laughs> I was really lucky. So my, my story is, is one that's a little strange. Um, I have never held a job outside of technology at all. I started working a uh, very long time ago, uh, a week after I graduated high school, I was lucky enough to get a job working with an IT organization for the summer. And it just so happened they took a liking to me. I stayed there through college. And so I've worked in corporate technology for the entirety of my career. Um, I have seen people who made a career switches. Uh, my son, who was working on a PhD in education, is now in technology. It took him about a year to, you know, to get focused and find the certifications that he needs, find an entry level job. Um, it's absolutely doable. But you have to have a plan, number one. Uh, number two, I think a lot of people here, STEM jobs and technology jobs are paying money, um, and they focus on that. But that's not the thing that I would focus on. Every job will pay money if you're an expert at it. So find something that you're good at. Um, and if you want to get into technology because you're really interested in it and you want to be able to sit down and learn, um, then I would do, then do that, like find an area that interests you and focus on getting good in that area, and then you'll see more results come. 
Okay, really well said. So of everything you said, I picked up on two things. After high school, people already, already realized you were a genius and like the tech <laughs> company zoomed in. And then to further that, you have a son that has a PhD, which is also signifying genius. So like from day one, I know you have been in tech, but like was it in your elementary school, you're just breaking down computers and hacking into them? Or how? Yeah, well, I'm old enough that we didn't have computers until I got to high school. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, I think uh, I was I was really lucky. So my uh, my family background, my mother, I was the first uh, grandchild of my grandparents. I was the first kind of niece nephew of all of her siblings. There were eight of them, and so when you're the first one, everybody kind of you're everybody's baby. Um, I had an aunt, my aunt Linda, who is is my favorite aunt, who took me to college with her and used to put books in, you know, and say, oh, you could read when you were three years old. And so uh, when I was very young, people established that I had the ability to do things um, in that realm, right, of, of being like, oh, you can you can learn this and you can do this. And so that, I just carried that forward. My father used to tell me, as long as they put it in a book, you can do it, right? So I, and then I tell my kids, I'm like, if they give me a manual to a space shuttle, at some point I could fly it, right? Because that's how you do it. So um, I think that, you know, a lot of people kind of get lucky in that way. You know, I was gifted and talented programs and all of these things when I was young. And, um, yeah, I just, I just always had a desire to learn. I think that was the biggest thing. So when I got that job, um, I didn't just show up every day. I was always asking questions. Hey, what does this do? Uh, my first job was helping to cut over from mainframe to token ring. If you, if anybody remembers what token ring is, that I'll tell you the gray, the gray <laughs> in my beard. Um, but yeah, I was always asking questions. Well, what is this? How does this work? What, what is token ring? Um, and I got lucky that there were people around who, when I asked those questions, would sit down and show me how to do those things. Okay. Shout out to Aunt Linda for pushing him and yeah. then also the father for great advice. I often ask people about like their social circles and what they have to like help them and push them. Like in addition to your family, were there other people along the way that helped motivate you? And Yeah, I, I've got a really, uh, I've been blessed to have a really good circle of friends. Uh, you know, guys that I went to, um, I have good friends who I actually went to preschool with who are still my friends today in our, in our 50s. Um, so, you know, I've got, you know, friends that are kind of hold each other accountable. Um, you know, it's kind of that old saying when you when you look at look around at your circle of friends, you kind of see where you where you are. Um, they're not all in technology. I have friends that are teachers, that are firemen, um, but they're all really positive type people. So we're always checking in with each other. We're always saying, "How's your family? You know, how are you doing? You know, and just kind of kind of holding each other up. And every time somebody wins, we kind of cheer for each other. So. I'm, I'm lucky in that way that I have people who not only, you know, who cheer for you like that, but they hold you accountable. Like, hey, you know, if they see you messing up, they want to ask you, hey, what's going on? You know, you need some help. Let me just sit down and talk. So uh, it's good to have that, that kind of circle. Okay. I mean, it sounds amazing. In addition to the social circle you have and your family, like we also talked about the job allows you to travel the world. And it seems like you've been to quite a lot of places. How has that impacted you, not necessarily working at a company X and location X, but like being in that location, being submerged in a new culture, how's that influenced you? Yeah, it, it traveling, um, I was lucky enough, I think I'm maybe in my very late 20s, I worked um, as a defense contractor and that allowed me to travel to, I, I worked and lived in Europe for a number of years. Um, I worked and lived in the Middle East and Kuwait and Dubai for a few years. Um, I worked and lived in Iraq for a couple of years. So um, travel really opened me up to just being able to understand different cultures, to see the world around me in a different way than just seeing something on the news, but to have real context to, you know, I was there um, after, you know, the, the Serbian conflict in you know in the late 90s um i saw refugee camps i saw you know uh air bases being built by the u.s government i saw uh firsthand you know uh baghdad and the green zone and so travel really opened my eyes up to kind of cultures around the world um and it made me more open to uh talking and speaking with people 
and understanding where they come from and, you know, what drives them. Okay, that's really cool. And the world is very multicultural, especially like in your workforce, my workforce, pretty much any mature and advanced workforce. Um, thinking about outside of work and activities that you may do outside of like professional services, how do you spend your time outside of work? Um, family, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with my family. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed enough now to have grandchildren. So uh, my grandson, shout out Matthew. Matthew just had a birthday yesterday. He turned nine. Happy birthday. Uh, my other grandson, Xavier. So those, those two, uh, I try to spend as much time with my family as possible. Uh, I love music. You and I share that love of DJing. So I've had a DJ business as a, as a kind of a side, you know, a hobby for many, many years. I DJ for friends and family. I play music all the time. What's your um, DJ name? DJ ProServe? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I, I, when I was very young, I, my name is Charles. So I was, I went by Charlie Chan. My friends, my friends today still call me Chan. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I, I marketed myself for a while as the Houston wedding DJ. I did weddings. Uh, I've since not, you know, I closed that business down. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just had a lot of fun with it, man. I, I love music. I love uh, playing music. Um, so those are, those are kind of the things I do. But mostly for me, it's, it's either uh, travel or being, you know, doing something with my family. Um, and sometimes my, my fiance hates that I, I like to entertain. I, I, if it was up to me, uh, my whole family would like live with me. But you know, can't do that. <laughs> well, I, I've been to his house. It is a mansion. He, I remember you telling me about the throwing a block party for the entire block for the, was it Mayweather fight in your backyard? Yeah, we did the Mayweather fight. We did the Super Bowl. That should tell big, you how big yeah, his house is. We put up a big projector. Um, yeah, we're going to do that for the Super Bowl too this year. I'm hoping I'm invited this year. So Of course. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. I, often in tech, like I talk with people and it's like, what do you do outside of work? Oh, the same stuff I do at work, like I focus on that outside of work and they don't have work-life balance. Where would you say, like, because it sounds like you have a pretty rich life of, like, family and music and so forth. How does that impact you positively at work, being able to, like, have these different worlds? Well, I, I think it allows me to to have focus, right? When I'm at work, I'm at work. Um, when I'm not at work, I'm not at work. Um, you know, I give uh, all I can when I'm at work. Um, you know, I, I, like we all do, I have to work more than 40 hours a week many of times. Uh, but when I'm not there, you know, this work allows me to be able to travel and spend time with my family. And the great thing, you know, uh, you know, clearly I'm not speaking on behalf of Google today, but the great thing about Google to me, um, in terms of my organization is they really want you to do that. They want you to have a life and then come back and work hard. So, you know. That's, that's one of the great things I like about the company. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, you actually brought up a good point. Some people focus on the job and maybe like what the job gives them access to as far as the technical work. But how would you coach someone when they're looking at companies and they're like, OK, how should outside of just the professional services work, what other things should they look at to know whether it's potentially a good job or not? Yeah, you, you really want to look at what the culture of the organization is. Um, every organization has a culture. Every organization talks about their culture. Uh, sometimes it's harder to understand what that is until you get inside. But I will say, at least for myself, um, as I got older in my career, when I went to interview for jobs, it was not a one way interview. You were not just interviewing me to see if I was a fit for you. I was interviewing you to see if you were a fit for me. Um, a good example is when I when I was interviewed uh, at AWS, I went in with a list of questions for every person that interviewed me. You know, I asked what made, you know, what makes you stay here? Uh, what do you find interesting about your job? Tell me some of the things that you like about your job. Tell me some of the things you don't like about your job. Um, so I think a lot of times people, especially younger people, may feel like you can't ask these questions. But I think it's important to understand that if you're going to be at work, um, other than spending time with your family, you, you, many people spend more time at work than they do with their families. So you got to think about how much time you're going to spend with these people. How much time are you going to spend in this organization? Um, if you have a certain set of skills, you're going to be able to find a job anywhere. You'll be able to find a career anywhere. So you have to really focus on uh, working with organizations um, that kind of fit you. And I think when you do that, you can also bring more value to those organizations and you can have a more rich career. You know, you can get paid more and you can excel more. But if you're working somewhere and it doesn't fit who you are, you're probably not going to be there that long anyway. 
Yeah, I agree 100%. Very well said. If you, you talked about a rich career, if you think about like where you're at now and where you want to go, like what would be next for you? How do you look at your career at this stage? I don't know, man. I, <laughs> I started so long ago that uh, I, I tell, so this is what I tell young people. The job I have today didn't exist when I started. The technology I have that we have today did not exist. There was no way for me to plot this course and say in 10 years or in 20 years, this is what I'm going to be doing. So um, what I like to do is, you know, for the very short term, look at what goals I have for the organization that I'm in and the role that I'm in to do the very best I can do. And if something comes up and I feel like a need to pivot, uh, there's a lot of people working in, in AI right now who didn't hear about AI until a few years ago, right? Who just looked at it and went, man, that's super interesting. It's something that I feel like I can do. I'm going to go learn that and hopefully you know, make that part of my career journey. So um, for me, I think right now it's focusing on, um, you know, bringing value. Uh, one of the reasons I'm a manager is I love to help people who are earlier in their careers um, avoid some of the pitfalls that I have, learn some of the things that I wish I would have learned earlier. So, um, you know, being a manager isn't easy, but for me, it's, it's kind of a calling because I'm like, I can help people and you know, quite frankly, I can help people who look like me sometimes to learn things that I wish I would have learned, you know, back in the day. Okay. And accelerate their career, which is a very noble thing to do. You had talked about the fact that, like, when you started, the technologies and even the work that you're doing now didn't exist. And what I'm reading from that also is, like, you need to be agile. And essentially, as the industry changes, you need to change. I'm curious how you recommend someone balance that out, because there's also the What's the newest thing of the day? Okay, AI, okay, generative AI, okay, uh, com quantum computing and people just like running around but they're not being focused. Like how would you suggest somebody to be focused but at the same time be agile and like kind of walk that fine line? Well, I, I think that's where being curious comes in. Um, there are lots of technologies that I know a little bit about um, because they're not things that I have to know for my job but there are things that, um, that I'm interested in. So I say... You know, for most people, you want to be able to just read and absorb the things that are in the marketplace. But maybe I say at least once a year, sit down, look at your career and say, what do I specifically need to learn to advance in my particular field or the field that I want to get to? So for me, everything starts with a decision. You can't just decide that you're going to go work, look at five different technologies because you're not going to be an expert. I mean, somebody might be if you're a super genius, but um, you're not going to go learn all of those things and be good at them, right? But what you can do is you can say uh, something I did earlier in my career. I was really interested in security. Um, I was doing a lot of infrastructure work and I was doing pro programming project management. And I sat down one day and said, okay, of these three things, which one am I most interested in? Which one do I think I'm the best suited to do long term? And quite frankly, which one of them pays the most? And so I looked at different areas and I said, okay, this is what I do pretty well. I'm interested in program management. If I do these things, then there's potential for me to, you know, reach kind of my financial goals in terms of where I want to be, um, you know, from a salary perspective. And that's when I started to focus on that. So um, I think it's decision and focus. So don't get caught up in the wave of what's the hottest, newest thing. That might be good for somebody who's very early in their career. But I think if you've already got a career, you know, figure out how you can incorporate the newest thing into what you're doing. So right now I'm learning, you know, generative AI offers and different things that I'm working on. Um, but I understand what my primary profession is. Okay. Really well said. Um, Often in our career, we have challenges that come up, and I know we've kind of laid out what it means to be in professional services. Have you faced any challenges in your career that you're willing to share and maybe use to motivate other people that you were able to overcome? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think everybody has challenges. I've had, um, you know, I've had challenges earlier in my career where, um, you know, quite frankly, I was given too much too fast. Right. So if you get promoted into a role that you're not ready for, even though you think you want the money that comes with it or you want the prestige that comes with it, but you can't actually deliver in that role, 
um, you're in for a world of hurt. So I think being aware of not only where you are strong, but being aware of where you are weak. Um, you know, I was lucky enough that when I was, you know, suffering in, hey, I don't know if this is the right job for me, or if this is the right role for me, or if, this, you know, you've given me too much responsibility, that I had someone that was able to, you know, put me on a path and say, this is exactly what you need to do in order to be successful. I went and did those things. I got better. Um, and as a result, I was able to come out of that. But I went through, you know, probably two years earlier in my career where I was given a really large organization to run uh, with some technology that I was not an expert in, and I had to sit down and figure it out. Um, you know, in some, in some cases, you don't get that lucky. You end up not having a job, but, uh, but I got really lucky. Uh, you know, I've had, um, as we all do, I've had personality conflicts at work where Maybe the person that I was working for um, was not, um, you know, we didn't have a personality that meshed. Um, and, you know, there's been times where I've had to decide, you know what, this isn't the right place for me. Um, and I was able to move on to some, you know, somewhere else that I felt was right, right. So um, I think for me, though, I'm not a person who, um, I don't make snap judgments, um, but I do always think of, you know, how do I create a plan to get to where I want to be? Um, and then the other thing is, you know, some of this stuff uh, is not life and death. Everybody makes mistakes. I think one of the best things you can do is own up to a mistake and go, hey, I made this mistake. It's on me. Um, how can we correct this? You know, take the steps to correct it and then make sure that, um, you know, I tell my kids once it was a mistake, twice is a pattern. So a mistake is fine. An accident is fine. Uh, doing something time and time again is not, and you'll, you'll end up uh, out of a job. So, um, yeah, there's, there's always going to be ups and downs, but um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the great things, um, yeah, I hear you on your podcast, ask people who they admire all the time. One of the great things about my mother is she's so steady, is that she, she, you don't see her too, too high. You never see her too, too low. And I think I get that from her. Sometimes if bad things happen at work, I'm like, all right, you got 24 hours to feel sorry for yourself. Tomorrow morning, you need a plan on how you go fix it. And that's the way I, I would do that. Okay. Shout out to Mama for always giving the good advice. Um, you kind of answered the question, but it's worth like explicitly uh, asking and you stating. A lot of people I see are very scared to make moves because they think like, oh, if I do this one thing wrong, like that's it for me. So in your infinite wisdom of your like elongated career, have you ever seen anyone like make one decision that has ended their career or something they couldn't recover from? Only people that have done things that fall outside the bounds of like legal legality. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, making a mistake at work, you, you may lose your job. But I've I've seen people who made big mistakes at work and end up, you know, unfortunately um, losing their job. I've been in positions where I've had to let people go for making, you know, really big mistakes. Uh, but I'm thinking of one person in particular. He's doing doing quite well now. You know, he learned from his mistake. But um, you know, the only people I've seen really do something that they can't come back from is people who've done things that they can't come back from in society in a way. So it's not just work. Okay. So don't get caught if you do something illegal. Yeah. Anyways. Don't, don't do, you know, be smart. Okay. And, and at this stage, I'm sure like you have a lot of wisdom and experience. So you mentor a lot of people, but I'm curious at this stage, do you have someone that mentors you or? I do. Um, one of the great things, uh, you know, uh, I have a, a mentor now, you know, my director who I work for, um, is kind of instrumental in um, in what I do in my career. He's someone who, uh, he's the best kind of manager, somebody I emulate. He is supportive. He always has my back, uh, but he is also very direct and will tell me, um, you know, where I need to get better or also will tell me, hey, you're doing a great job. Everything is going well. Um, so uh, for me, I like to know, hey, what can I do better? So he'll tell me everything's good, or he'll say, hey, you know, you made a mistake here. You need to think about this next time. Uh, but he always says, I got your back uh, if you need me. So uh, that's, you know, that's really good. Um, and also, you know, I take, um, you know, when you work for these companies, take advantage of what they offer. Um, you know, fortunately, Google offers coaching for their managers. They, they spend the money to have professional coaches um, you know, sit with you for up to six months. I recently joined a coaching program where 
I'm going to have a coach who is helping me to be a better manager. I'm going to take that advice. Um, I talk to coaches and professional coaches outside of work. Um, I think everybody needs someone you can sit down and talk to and just bounce things off of. Okay. A really great answer. Also want to give his director slash mentor a shout out. I don't know the brother that well, but like I reached out to you and within minutes I'm thinking like, okay, maybe he'll meet with me two, three weeks down the line. But like within minutes, he's like, oh yeah, uh, this Friday, like let's just jump on a call and we jumped on and he helped me as if I'm working at the company and he knows me well. So it's really good to have that. Um, I'm curious, a lot of people look at the opportunity, but I learned kind of recently in the experience that I had that there's the opportunity, but to be successful, you also have to have people that are willing to advocate for you inside because there's like limitations on what you as an individual can do without people advocating. And it sounds like your director, in addition to being a mentor, is someone that advocates for you. Can you maybe speak to that, like having someone advocate for you throughout your career and how that's helped? Yeah, vitally important. Um, and it's one of the things as a manager I try to do uh, for people in my organization, um, having someone to be not just a champion, but to provide you with opportunities. Um, I think that is that is where leaders can really make a difference in your career is finding people who won't just say, hey, you're doing a great job, but say, hey, there's a presentation that you can take part in, or um, there's this, you know, program that we're, that we're doing. Would you like to be a part of it? Or would you like to be a part of this team that we have to develop something internally? So when you provide people the opportunity, um, it allows them to help build their personal brand within the company. And so you may be known as, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's Chuck. He's the guy that worked on that project that we, you know, that we implemented globally, or, you know, that's this person. And, oh yeah, I remember he built this dashboard that we use. And so um, it's really good when you have leaders who will provide you opportunities to show that you can work at the next level, that you can achieve and that you can advance. And so I'm really, I'm really glad that I do have someone who, um, like I said, they'll, they'll tell me what I'm doing wrong, but when I'm doing right, they also advocate for me and say, hey, you should be a part of this. So you should be in this meeting. Um, I think that's really important. OK, really well said. Um, man, you've given so much great advice today, like thinking about maybe parting words for someone who looks at this. They're motivated. They're like, hey, I want to be like that guy when I grow up. Um, what kind of like parting advice would you give people as far as like how to progress their career in meaningful ways and like you have? Sure. Step one is your decision. What do you want to do? Um, I talk to so many young people who say, oh, I'd like to get into tech. And I go, you know, they're saying you'd like to get into medicine, right? You could, you, there's so many different things that you could do. Um, so let's talk about the different jobs that are available to you, what skill sets you have, what level of education you have, then make a decision about what you'd like to do. Then we can create a plan on how to get you there. Um, you cannot and I've done this myself, you cannot be, uh, you know, the, the jack of all trades uh, and, and really be successful. You have to decide on something to do, uh, create a plan, start taking steps. And then once you're in it, you can pivot if you need to. But until you make a decision, you can't get anywhere. Okay, really well said. As far as people that have listened to this, they want to follow up with you. I know like you DJ, you professional service, you're doing a lot of different stuff, but I believe also you professionally speak out uh, for people that are interested in like your experience and your background. If they want to bring you in from a professional services perspective to help them out, like can you just speak to the best way to contact you and specifically sure, um, what to contact you We'll, we'll have, I think, my LinkedIn here. LinkedIn is, is the best way to get in touch with me. Reach out to me there and be more than happy to have a conversation. Okay. And the things you want people to reach out to you for, probably speaking or? Yeah, definitely uh, speaking engagements, um, you know, different workshops, especially on pro program management, project management. And then just people who are looking for mentorship. I talk to, you know, people all the time just to have questions um, and try to help them, you know, solidify and clarify what their plan is. So I'm always open to people, you know, talking to people who may have questions just about how do I get into tech or how can I change my career? I've helped uh, a bunch of people, uh, you know, just put together that plan. And that's not something I, you know, try to charge people for or coach or anything like that. This is just 10%. Yeah. Yes. I, no, no, this is just, if you, if you, if you want to bounce your questions off someone who's been there and done that, I'm more than happy to do that uh, for people who are, are serious. 
So. Okay. And I can vouch Charles as a genuine brother. That's kind of how we met. I needed some help. And before I can even get the question out of my mouth, he genuinely helped me. So very appreciative. And then you also chose to come on the show and help me out. So really appreciative, man. I appreciate your time and coming out here. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching the show today. Uh, This is Jamal signing off with Emerging Podcast. Peace. Peace. And that wraps our show for today. I want to thank you for listening to the Emerging Podcast with your host, Jamal Robinson, and ask that you like and subscribe to the podcast across your favorite platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. It's free for you and significantly helps out the show. You can also check out our newsletter on LinkedIn. I hope this show has added some value in your life, and until next time, peace.